This little book, Sid Saxon's Gamut of Games, was published in 1969. One of the most popular, and justly so, um, and I think everybody should own a copy. It's got some great games in here. And this week I'm going to talk about one of Sid Saxon's own favorite games, one that he did not design. Back in the late uh, 1960s, uh, there was a group of guys uh, in New York City. They called themselves the New York Game Associates. It was just kind of a club of guys that were gamers and uh, also game inventors. They would get together now and again and compare ideas and talk about game design. Uh, one of their members was the aforementioned Sid Saxon, uh, who wrote this book. Another was Alexander Randolph, who uh, was a prolific game designer. Another member of that group was a Canadian polymath uh, who was named Claude Soucy, or Soucy, not sure how to pronounce that. To say that Claude and Sid were close friends, I guess, is easy enough to say uh, Claude's daughter married Sid's son. I can just imagine the uh, fathers-in-law gathering together for a family meal and uh, sitting in the corner talking about games all evening. One of Mr. Soucy's games was a card game called Big Funeral. And uh, it was published by a company in New York in 1964. That company's name was uh, Kooky Games. And uh, I guess it was kind of a kooky game. Another of his games was called Watch. It was uh, published by MPH Games in 1967. MPH was a modest player in the games a business. I guess probably their most well-known game would be Crypto. And Crypto was published in uh, America and Europe and the UK and that was a pretty good match for the game Watch. So it also got published in Germany and uh, in the UK. The German version of that by Abaca Spiel was called Quick. But by far the most popular of Claude Soucy's games was Lines of Action. He apparently created the game in 1969 just in time to get into Sid's book. The game is rather prominent in the book, one of the first ones that he talks about. And it proved to be pretty popular amongst the scholarly crowd. Uh, found its way around from college campus to college campus. And uh, nobody ever really knew what the name of the game was. Ultimately, in about 1980, it was actually published uh, in Europe. In 1987, Hexa Games in Germany picked it up. They uh, were already familiar with Claude's games. And about that time, they started it just calling the game LOA. And uh, chess players started to pick up on it and enjoyed the problem-solving aspect of it and some of the more complex strategies involved in playing the game. And it ended up being a uh, candidate for the Spiel des Jahres in uh, 1988. It found its way into some chess magazines and uh, became more and more popular. And there are websites that are dedicated to LOA, and they record move-by-move uh, -move records of uh, tournaments and present their subscribers with challenges and so on. The Mind Sports Olympiad is a world championship of a wide variety of different board games. And, of course, people from all over the world come to compete in these less-than-well-known games. And uh, so there has been a world champion of uh, LOA now for quite some time. Uh, it seems to be dominated by players from England and Estonia, interestingly enough. I have a couple of names here I want to try to pronounce. Georges Gomez Arousi and Gianfranco Buccellero. They're the world champions of LOA right now and they're both pretty consistent tournament winners and the computer experts hire them to play LOA against the computers. That's the caliber of player they are. Some of the tournament games are even on YouTube if you want to uh, watch it being played in real time by some experts. Here's a quick little set I put together. It's just my non-checkered checkerboard and uh, a bunch of uh, old used checkers. It's a game of connection. Uh, what you're trying to do is ultimately get all your checkers connected in one group. On a board of 64 squares, like a chessboard, each player has a set of 12 distinctly colored pieces. They begin on the board as shown here, set on the player's own near and far edges. All these pieces can move in any direction, orthogonal or diagonal. 
The distance they can move, however, is dictated by the number of pieces that occupy that line of movement. Here are a couple of examples. If this red piece was moved diagonally, it would be able to move two spaces because there are two pieces on the board along that line. The same piece can't move straight ahead because of the yellow piece blocking its path. This brings us to a very important rule. A piece cannot jump over an enemy piece to land beyond it. But a piece can jump over one of the player's own pieces. This is not a capture. This does not remove that playing piece. Pieces can capture enemy pieces by displacement, like in chess. That is, if a moving piece ends its movement on a space occupied by an opposing piece, that opposing piece is removed from the game and the moving piece takes its place. So again, the objective is to get all your pieces connected, that is, adjacent to all your other pieces in one big group. Just as important is keeping your opponent from doing the same thing. Annihilation is not always a good strategy, because if your opponent has only two pieces, it makes it easier for them to form that final group of all their pieces connected. In fact, if a player has only one piece left, they win. All of their pieces, one piece, forms one group connected to itself. So is fewer pieces an advantage? Not necessarily. Having more pieces is usually an advantage because they can limit the opponent's options as they mass together. Another popular tactic is to trap opposing pieces against the edge of the board so they can't be moved. Sort of underhanded, I suppose, but if you're in it to win, that could help. There are other rules clarifications. The best place to go for answers appears to be this Maastricht University site. It's not a very pretty website, but the information is all there. Claude Suse passed away in 1996, uh, but his game lives on. In fact, his name lives on. Uh, there's a particular chess problem that's uh, named in his honor. But the fact that you can play the game with a chessboard and checkers uh, makes it very easy for people to pick it up and uh, give it a shot. So I want to be sure that you uh, get the name of this book here, Gamut of Games by Sid Saxon. It's definitely worth picking up. Uh, should be on every game player's library. In 1982, Sid Saxon revised his Gamut of Games slightly, made some clarifications in the rules, and incorporated a couple of changes. Grab yourself some checkers and a chessboard and uh, give it a try. It's a real fun little game and has a depth of strategy to it so that it never really gets old. There's always some new challenge coming around the bend. And so I enjoin you all to, uh, to give it a try. And meanwhile, whatever you play, be sure to play every day. Thank you.